Hello, welcome to BIPOC Voices in Speculative Fiction, a program in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. If you haven't read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from your local bookseller or for, from our bookseller for this event, please visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, we hope you'll consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Also, we appreciate the help of our community partners in, in sharing this event. Thank you. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Catherine, Catherine Hernandez, author of Crosshairs, is a queer woman of color, theater practitioner, and the artistic director of B Current Performing Arts and the Sulong Theater. Her debut novel, Scarborough, won the 2015 Asian Canadian Writers Workshop Emerging Writers Award and was shortlisted for the 2017 Toronto Book Awards. She is of Filipino, Spanish, Chinese, and Indian heritage, and is married into the Navajo Nation. Jordan Ifueco, author of Ray Bearer, is a Nigerian-American writer who grew up eating fried plantains while reading comic books under a blanket fort. She now lives in Los Angeles with her husband and their collection of Black Panther Funko Pops. Ray Bearer is her debut novel. And our moderator, Dr. Grace Gibson, is an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. As a Black future feminist, Black creative scholar activist, her research and teaching interests explore Black popular culture, digital humanities, representations of race and gender within comic books, Afrofuturism, and race and new media. Thank you all for joining us today. Grace, take it away. Thank you. So let me just first say that I'm truly excited to be able to uh, talk to both of our authors today and very much excited to be able to participate um, in this conversation. So uh, you all came to hear uh, about the authors and talk to them. So let's go ahead and, and dive right in. So this question is for both uh, Catherine, you, Catherine and Jordan. Um, who are some of your literary inspirations when it comes to writing who do you kind of channel or, or what things do you channel in as it relates to uh, your writing? It's interesting because I've always loved speculative fiction and fantasy, but that's a genre that's never loved me back as a dark skinned <laughs> black girl. And so I had to find mirrors of representation, you know, in terms of what I related to, but only pieces of me. So like I'd read a book that made me feel seen as a black girl. Um, it's funny, but the Addie books from American Girl were some of my earliest representations. And even that's about, oh, you know, an escaped slave, you know, in the United States, but that's only the beginning. Like so much of the book is about her like building her life, which was really rare in the nineties <laughs> as a kid, as a black girl trying to find like, you know, kind of adventure books. Um, I also tended to read a lot of British fiction. Nigeria is a British colony, and so that's how my parents were educated, and we just had those in the house. Um, um, Charlotte Bronte was a big deal to me. I loved, you know, just all of her, like, you know, woman going against the patriarchy and demanding to have her own agency stories, and they all have, like, a little bit of a supernatural tint to them. Um, honestly, I felt kind of like a pioneer writing fantasy with Black people. Um, as a teenager, Ray Bear, I started when I was 13. I didn't actually have any examples. Um, now I draw so much inspiration from the new blossom of, of speculative, Black speculative writers over the last 10, 15 years. N.K. Jemison is someone who I would probably faint if I ever meet because She's a freaking genius. So I get a lot of inspiration from her for sure. Um, uh, I could pretend that uh, I'm, I'm uh, well educated in uh, speculative fiction, but, um, and that it was speculative fiction that actually inspired Crosshairs. But I would say that um, the, the biggest inspiration for this book in particular uh, was Adrienne Marie's, Marie Brown's Pleasure Activism. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, I really wanted to, sh to show um, like a play by play for hope uh, because, you know, the book is, is uh, dramatizing um, the rise of fascism around the world uh, 
specifically tar targeting uh, QT BIPOC elderly and disabled populations. And while that's quite heavy, I really wanted to show that change is possible and that change could be embodied, um, and not only by our perpetrators, like not, not only by perpetrators um, embodying the change um, and learning allyship, but also for us, the people who uh, sit at crossroads, uh, different crossroads of oppression, that uh, part of the revolution is also for us to give ourselves pleasure in many different ways, um, be it uh, love, food, sex, all of those things. Um, and uh, so her, her work really inspired me to um, ensure that the, the book wasn't uh, just about these horrible uh, possibilities, like a nightmare come uh, to life, but rather that it could be also a dream come true if we play our cards right. And I like how both of you all brought in ideas that weren't necessarily attached to um, people of color as it relates to in the speculative or, or the idea of being able to have joy, experience joy, um, be able to feel empowered you know, be able to know that, yes, we go through pain and trauma, but there's also, you know, uh, ways to enjoy and have have the smile on the face to to feel like you can thrive and not just survive, uh, so to speak. And so considering um, the speculative genre, sci-fi, magic realism has been very much um, white, cis um, um, oriented, how do both of you as women of color um, you know, how, how is your, your work specifically, your, your crosshairs and Ray Bear, um, what does it mean to write in this genre, you know, personally and uh, for the larger community? Um, so one of the first things I knew I wouldn't do in Ray Bear is make it a Black pain story. I, it's not that those stories aren't important, they absolutely are, but if you only ever see yourself represented in narratives of pain and struggle, I think that has its own really horrible implications, you know, um, and impact, especially on developing minds, since I write YA for children to teenagers and young adults. So Ray Bearer, while all of the characters go through significant struggles and trauma, none of it is related, at least with the protagonist and the color of their skin. I think with fantasy, we're able to write a Black narrative that doesn't hinge on their oppression. Um, there is imperialism in the book, but the ruling class is actually dark-skinned and coded as Yoruba, as West African. And so Tari's size struggle, while she does have to decide, you know, what to do with systems of oppression, you know, she benefits from it, but also it oppresses her as a woman. Um, she needs to find out whether she's going to swallow the propaganda or whether she's going to, you know, because that's safer and it will protect people she loves as well, or if she's going to risk everything to try and get a better world. Um, but you never see, like, it's interesting, I didn't even do this part consciously, she is never the victim of physical violence. She has like an emotionally and psychologically abusive mother, you know, that kind of thing. But I was so tired of reading books where girls who looked like me got hit if they were the protagonist. You know, it's just, it's one thing to see your oppression reflected, like that's really cool, but to never see yourself um, in a place where you're elevated, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting, it's, it shows how different empowering narratives are for different kinds of people in the intersection, right? Because for a lot of white women, I've seen like an empowering narrative for them is like, don't treat me like I'm made of glass and I'm gonna, I hate dresses and I'm gonna get on a horse and I don't wanna be your princess, which is empowering if you have been put on a, you know, pedestal that prevents you from doing things because you're considered too precious and weak. But if you've been considered, if you've been dehumanized and considered like you can't feel pain because you know, you're a rough black girl, whatever, you know, an empowering narrative might very well be a story in which an entire empire 
wants to kiss your feet and just treat you like you are the most precious thing that has ever happened. And that is Tari Sai's story. She's in the upper echelons of privilege and she has to decide what to do with it. Like that's one of the main struggles. And I'd never seen a story like that um, featuring a girl who looked like me. So um, I have completely lost sight of the original question, but I'm glad I said all that. <laughs> you did it perfectly. You perfectly. <laughs> I love that, Jordan. And I'm, I, I, I'm sure that it's empowering for your readers, but it must have been so transformative as a writer to take on um, like a different narrative such as that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is, uh, there was, um, uh, okay, can we talk about like Instagram reviewers? I, some of them are so generous. Some of them are so generous. And I don't think that, um, uh, like to, for, for me, I, I've just been amazed by how wonderful and gracious people have been on, um, because, and what's wonderful about Instagram is the fact that, you know, they're, they're not people who are part of these very traditionally white institutions for reviewing. They're just readers. <laughs> and one reader said something that was so profound to me about, um, about crosshairs, which is that isn't all organizing, um, in, you know, in the case in the book where the characters are organizing towards this, um, this big event where it's like a big revolt uh, against the, the um, fascist regime that isn't all political organizing science fiction. And that was so powerful to me because that's exactly what I think of when it comes to science, to, to speculative fiction science fiction is that we're imagining a world for ourselves, right? And you know, when you when you were mentioning Grace, is that when you have this uh, predominant um, uh, sci-fi world that is um, it's predominantly white, heterosexual, cisgender, um, able-bodied, is that you realize what they're imagining? They're imagining a world in which it does not include us at all, because that to them is a bright future. A bright future does not include us. Um, whereas what's so amazing is that giving um you know putting the pen in our hands and the fact that it is completely unstoppable in qt bipoc um, hands what we can imagine for the future um it has been very powerful because i really wanted to imagine people like 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 the big um, you know the the big sci-fi moment for me was can white cisgender able-bodied heterosexual people can what do I imagine if they were actually to change? And so I asked people from my community, what what would you want to see, like you know, in in people's um, like like what would you want to see in their bodies and the way they speak and everything? And you know, we distilled it down to like four lines about like what allyship actually looks like, um, and made it a creed in the book. And um, that for me was a, a very powerful moment for me is that like, I can imagine it. And if I can imagine it, it can happen. Um, because I, I wrote the first part of the book thinking, uh, this is, <laughs> we're doomed, we're doomed. Um, and uh, you know, uh, at that time there were these uh, mass floods here in, on, um, in Toronto where I live. And uh, I, I thought like, you know, this is, mm, this is it. I had no idea what was gonna happen with the pandemic. Um, and, I, I remember is like, you know, I, I have to believe that there's hope. That's the only way I can write this book. I can finish this book. And and when I saw that that Instagram reviewer had said that, it's that it's like the book, it, um, it like all science fiction, it, like all um, organizing, like political organizing and science fiction, that really blew me away. And I'm glad that that, per, that, that it resonated in that way for that reader. Yeah. And, and you know, once again, excellent points that you all are bringing up. And it makes me think about this idea that you all have the ability to rewrite the script, rewrite the narrative. Um, you all have the opportunity to normalize or uh, provide another reality that is often marginalized, made invisible, not even thought of, talked about. So the fact that you all wield the pen to you know, make sure that readers can see and can you know provide that review that says organizing as science fiction, and and you know it's interesting when you you mentioned about the generosity of reviews. Um, I think we've been so accustomed to 
uh, reviews being geared towards a certain way or being so sharp and, 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 and so um, critical that we, we don't get a chance to really see the impact that many of these books and these stories really have on individuals. So uh, social media, you know, as it has its pros and cons, definitely provides another outlet for us to uh, see um, what our books can do for somebody and the way it can change our mind and change our thinking. So, um, so yes, thank you. Thank you all for that. And, and for, um, I won't even say the courage, just for the fact that you all did it, you, you wrote this, the story and, and you put it pen to paper. So, yeah. Um, all right, so let's kind of dive into some of uh, the, the protagonists or the main protagonists of each of you all's text. Um, how would you say that the main protagonists or characters um, for each of your books speak to the current climate of society and even maybe even potentially uh, historical past, uh, past uh, societal climates at all, if they do? And anybody can jump ahead. <laughs> I think Tari Sai, I, I, there's so much that she represents about my personal growth that I didn't realize was happening at the time because I was going through it. Because I started this book when I was 13 and just kind of continually rewrote it until I was in my 20s. Her journey tends to reflect the epiphanies that I was getting at the time. One recurring theme of hers is you know, deconstructing systems of belief in herself and why she, and she has to do that first before she can change anything externally, which is something very much I was going through. Fantasy that is Eurocentric, it's way more than, you know, green, cool climates and, you know, traditionally Western castles. It's also the mindset you know, you think of a lot of popular children's fantasy, um, say C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, you know, which, you know, I still have, there's still things about it I'm very fond of, but realizing how inherently imperialist the narrative is, like it's literally about blonde children coming into a land they've never been before and assuming the right to rule it, even though they don't look like anyone there, and that's just the way it's meant to be. They've been waiting for them to come in <laughs> and rule. And now they're finally here and the bad people are the people who want them gone. So, you know, like, you know, this is like the height of British imperialism, you know, like the forties and that kind of thing when C.S. Lewis was writing. So the original drafts of Ray Bearer unconsciously mirrored those narratives, even though it wasn't about white people it was still this very Eurocentric plot structure of there's an empire and it's good and it's golden and people want to threaten it and they're going to destroy it and we have to protect it because we're the rightful rulers. And so as I grew up, the story became um, the main character, Tari Sai, trying to accept this narrative and, and genuinely accepting it and when she gets, con con you know, when she starts like getting her own ideas, she thinks they're evil and they're dangerous because that's what she's been told. And so she willfully suppresses her own intellect so that she can conform to the narrative that she wants to believe until it just comes to a breaking point. And she's, she has to make a very quick and clear choice and she does. So I think that for those of us who are growing up and especially in this era of, you know, information is more accessible than ever before, but also people who are oppressed are having, like they're able to expose what's happening more easily than ever before and share it faster than ever before. Like with the, with, you know, Black Lives Matter, all of that has always been happening in the United States, but it was just this crucial turning point where enough of us had cameras on the ground that everyone around the country realized like, wait, they shoot black people in your neighborhood too? <laughs> you know, like, wait, this is a widespread systematic problem that's still happening, you know? Um, and I think having that, you know, those scales fall from your eyes as a young person, even if you have always belonged to a marginalized group is something that a lot of people will be able to relate to. 
Um, I also think as a personal journey, for me and for Tari Sai, one thing she does is try and reject the legacy that she comes from um, because she's afraid of it. And she has valid reasons to be afraid of it. Um, and so she goes through all of these different stages of trying to say like, oh, you know, I'm never going to be like my ancestors who did this and this thing to the people they love. And, you know, I'm completely different. And that doesn't work, that level of denial. So she goes the other extreme of, I'm going to be just like them, I'm doomed. I'm going to hurt everyone I love. <laughs> and, you know, that that's also an extreme. And she has to find that balance of recognizing your influences the negative ones that come from your environment, that come from your family, that come from your different parts of privilege or ignorance, um, and getting agency to overcome those while also acknowledging that they're there, um, which is something that I think any person with any kind of privilege has to do at some point, whether you're able-bodied or whether you have, you know, some kind of class privilege. I feel that I had some degree of class privilege um, just in that, you know, my parents could afford to immigrate here, you know, like, like the majority of people in Nigeria, right? And so, and, and then the different advantages that gives you over Black Americans as well. I was born and raised here, but I was able to enter into the system at more stability than someone like, I am descended from African, from American slaves as well, but mostly from Nigerians who immigrated, um, you know, and just balancing that, like, you know, there are parts of your blackness that are definitely oppressive, but there's also levels of privilege you have over other people who share your marginalized status. And so all of that gets unpacked um, in Tarisai's life as I was unpacking it in my life. <laughs> and so I've, I've already heard from lots of really wonderful readers the different parts of that that they felt represented in. And so that's been really cool. Jordan, I just want to say that I am so proud of you. I can't believe that like you started writing this at 13. What was I doing at 13 other than stapling my kilt in a bathroom to make it look shorter so that boys will look at my legs? I mean, that was basically all I was doing. Um, you, oh you, I, I just I just hope you understand how accomplished you are. <laughs> um, so uh, I would say that with Kay, um, my protagonist, he is a um of mixed heritage uh jamaican filipino gay feminine man um and the way that i had uh written him into being was uh, there, there were two reasons why he was so important to me um, one of them was that i wanted to make sure that the protagonist had no way of you know code switching hiding uh, changing the way that he was in order to be protected from the fascist regime. Um, as he says in the book is that he, you, you can't, you can't scrub off the skin and you can't, you can't switch off the femme. It's just the reality, um, just like how it is uh, for myself and my partner. I really wanted to show um, what it was like to be part of the um, QT BIPOC uh, umbrella um, is that, you know, going to the washroom is a, uh, could be a choice of life and death. Um, you know, the simple act of like going to, uh, you know, going on the bus late at night, uh, you know, pre-COVID times, it, it could be a, a choice of life and death. Um, and as we're seeing now with the pandemic is that even just the choice, the, the need to work for your family could be life and death, mm -hmm. right? So um, that was very specific for me, uh, is that there was no hiding for him. Um, there was that. There was also, ref I needed this character to really call out something that was very important to me, which is uh, to call out the rampant anti-Black racism in the Filipino community, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a conversation that is, like, it's, it's not, it, it's not calm, it's not a common conversation um, in, in the media is, uh, you know, POC communities and anti-Blackness. And also, uh, you know, like various levels, like how complicated it gets when then you're dealing with like black trans women and uh, or like sex workers, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and so for uh, Kay, I, I really wanted to show that he has, that there's two things going on is that he's hiding from a fascist regime in the present, 
but he has also lived in a, a life in which he has never been safe. Um, even as he was born, uh, his mother saw him as a this this basically the souvenir from a um, from a relationship that had failed, and that he represented to her um, this thing that was that was dirty and that was wrong, um, and um, and his, you know his mother being Filipino uh, is just that to to show what anti-black racism looks like with filipinos at the helm of that it, and it, it can be um it, it's ugly despite the fact that we do have um like just showing that while we are oppressed in some ways is that our our um, proximity to whiteness keeps us safe in so many other ways um, and that was very important to me uh, to show that through the life of k um, and, uh, but, but also showing that because he sits at the crossroads of, of these different identities is how important it is for him to fight back, um, because he's lived a life in which he's almost like completely stilled and dissociated from the evil things that keep on happening to him is that he finally finds the strength closer to the end of the book to, to and he chooses to fight finally. So all of that was very important for me um, in, in K. I'm sorry, I just have to ask real quick, is this a series? Ah, I wish. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, that, that was another thing that somebody said on Instagram was that this should be like an HBO show. I mean, like, um, uh, I mean, oof. let's just bring that up into the universe. Let's hope that it happens because I am a television writer. But uh, yeah, like it's, yeah, it's just, um, it, it yeah, it, it feels like that now that I'm like, <laughs> Not that I'm uh, saying it out loud. Yeah, this feels like it, it is a television show. I hope I hope one day it does become. Oh, oh well, I mean, yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> I was just wondering if even as a book, if there are more installments or if for now it's a standalone or. Right now it's a standalone. You know, what's so funny is that people, when they, you know, I won't get give away the ending of the book, but there were a lot of people like, but I just want to know what happens at the end. And a lot of times I say, you know what? It's not me that I don't want to write. I want white people to write it. Okay. like just you write it because I'm done I think all, all of us feel the same way is that like I'm just so done trying to show what should be done oh yeah whereas I feel like I feel like white it's time for white folks to go what can I do yes and mm -hmm. can I do it you know I think that that's why I left the book yeah. the way that it is and we'll <laughs> leave it at that <laughs> absolutely <Yeah. laughs> and it, so it's um in saying that, like, my hope that for readers who get to get both of y'all's books realize that this can translate into multiple spaces, you know, that it doesn't have to be just for the casual reader. Um, I myself as a professor hope, you know, will make sure to bring it into the classroom because everybody needs to hear these stories. It, you know, everybody needs to, you know, um, pick up, you know, and normalize this these narratives. Everybody needs to know that there are other um people that exist, that it is not a one, that we don't live in a monolithic society. And so uh, both uh, Crosshairs and Ray Bear definitely, uh, you know, tell the story like, hey, you know, I'm here. And, you know, not only am I here, but you need to recognize <laughs> that I'm here. And that's, that's what I definitely um, get from um, both of you all's books. Uh, wow, who I'm telling you, you know, <laughs> learning so much and getting so much, it's like, <laughs> And you know, to get it firsthand from you all is is really uh, truly a um, a treat. It's um, I'm definitely getting the unapologetic vibes, and um, I wish I hope more literature and more books, you know, continue to uh, to do that. I just want to say real quick, yes. I'm so glad you're a professor. I have never gotten to have a black I never got to have a black professor my entire education, and I'm just like <laughs> I'm just like what it would have meant. <laughs> what it would have meant so thank you for having your job and doing your job <laughs> yes thank you so much for doing your job i haven't i you know i haven't had one either i would have actually had a good degree if it was <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, and it's interesting that you both say that because many of my students tell me that that you know and i think I kind of sometimes I'm shocked. I'm like, wait a minute, you you've not like th I'm your first. Like, wait a minute, no, this 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 shouldn't be happening. And so um, it motivates me even more 
to, to make sure to push, you know, um, to get those stories, get, you know, tell those, bring those lessons to the forefront. So thank you all also for that. Like, Hey, is this a team effort that we all have? So. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, so here's some individual, it's an individual question for each of you all. Uh, so for, for Catherine, um, the speculative along with dystopia fiction allows a space for marginalized and invisible voices to be heard. And so uh, you kind of touched upon this already, but if you could go a little deeper, how does Crosshairs rewrite the script uh, for um, LGBTQ and BIPOC voices within the speculative, within dystopia, within magic realism, all of that? Oh, I'm so glad that you're even like, I love this, it's like, um spitfire round uh, between <laughs> me and Jordan. Um, no, because this is such an important thing to say because, you know, when you think about, I, I think one of the things about the book that rubbed people the wrong way, uh, you know, because, you know, sometimes people have feelings, they catch feelings when they read stuff like this, is that they, uh, like, there's this call to action that I'm specifically saying in the book, which is that you can see endless, endless examples of QT BIPOC folks suffering. And there's almost like this weird macabre fascination that the mainstream has with uh, books like that, that watch us suffer. But I think think that what's rubbing people the wrong way is that I'm showing that the these folks then say no more. And that it's not just about us fighting back, it's about us saying to them, look in the mirror and embody the change. Because that's a hard thing to do is that we're not saying just tell me something nice. Don't not we're not saying treat me nice. Uh, you know, house me, feed me, you know, tolerate me, la la. We're saying in, like in the book, I'm saying in your body, you must believe that I have, I should have equal access to resources and that I should be able to live and love the, is, you know, equally the, the same as you. Mm -hmm. And that is a very difficult thing for people in the mainstream to hold inside of them is that, oh, but wait, but I can't I just post like something on Instagram about MLK Day. Mm -hmm. Can't I just, um, can't I just like put like a little black square, you know, in support of Black Lives Matter? And I think that that call to action really has caused a lot of readers to have some feelings about it. Um, yeah. And um, I've had to, I've had to mourn it because I'm just like, wow, it's like that, 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 that's really that hard for people, right? Um, and so uh, what I, I feel like my, my work is doing is that I, I really want to, much like what Jordan is saying, un unfortunately, there is a lot of suffering in Crosshairs. <laughs> is, that, is that I'm saying this is the suffering that they've been through. This is why they're fighting back. But now the, you know, the ball is in your court. The ball is in your court. And that means that, uh, you know, that anything beyond embodied allyship is just a performance. So um, I, 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 you know, that's been an interesting thing. And I, I, I understand that it's rubbing some people the wrong way. However, I just, I'm just like leaving it to the universe and I'm just gonna have hope um, that even if it's like three people, that's all I'm praying for, even if it's just three people who embody it for the rest of their lives, then, then I'll be very happy. It's, it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> I love the you know? that just like people have had some feelings. Like that's all you yeah, yeah. to say. You don't need to give that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You get to say that sometime in like a live panel to like one of those like more of a, a comment than a question people like, I see you are having some feelings, sir. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's not our job, right? It's not our homework. <laughs> I already made the book. I made the book. What do they want you to do? Like to change them? Just, it's out there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 I think, I think, you know, um, to engage in a lifetime practice of allyship is a little bit, it's a lot for people. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, and, and it, it, it's, it's up to people if they want to 
actually go for it or not. Um, and I know that it's hard for me sometimes too, like as a person who has a certain amount of privilege too, is that sometimes it's hard for me to, to meet the, um, my daily practice. Um, and, and sometimes I fail and I get it. Um, and at the same time, I'm like, where it's just at such a critical time in our history, I don't, I don't think that we have room for subtleties. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, let's, let's just jump. Let's go. Let's go for it. So that, that's how I feel. That's how I feel. And, and, you know, people like you, Jordan, and you, Grace, like you gave me so much hope. It's go so great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Back at you for sure. Add to what you were saying about that discomfort, you know, then that's when I respond. W- welcome to my world. Welcome to what I experience on a day-to-day basis. And, uh, and you tell me not to complain. And you tell me to have a seat. Well, you have several seats. You know, you take that in, you, you digest that, you know, and, and, and see what we experience regularly. Like you said in the book, I don't get to take off my skin mm-hmm. and be someone else. I don't get to situate, you know, my thought and put in something else. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So, um, yeah, that's like I said, it's welcome to my world, have several seats and, you know, and we'll go from there, uh, as far as what you're thinking. <laughs> um, Yes. Okay. Jordan. So as someone who just finished, uh, Tommy at, um, at EMA's, uh, series with, uh, children of blood and bone and children of virtue and vengeance, it's really important, you know, uh, to bring in the African diaspora into fantasy and YA and, and the fact that there's this increasing popularity. So, um, what what can you add to that as far as the importance of bringing specifically the African diaspora into um, YA and fantasy? I mean, one thing I love about the African diaspora is that, or I guess all Black people, this would include, you know, continental Africans as well, but especially with the diaspora, I've heard it described as a people who have been given like the worst rotting you know, fetid lemons and consistently managed to make the most delicious lemonade that is stolen and loved and coveted worldwide. Black culture is king. Like it's, 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 you know, people don't like black people, but they sure love black culture. (laughs) Every single continent has a huge, is hugely informed by the inventions, the music, the stories, the slang, the clothing of Black diaspora. And I think that it's one of the saddest and most interesting paradoxes that Black diaspora are largely considered to be a cultureless people, you know, this because, simply because people have seen us actively making our culture. You know, I think it's just easy to assume like, oh, well, you know, like my culture has been around for 500, 1000 years. So, you know, and you guys don't really, you're just like, you know, the descendants of slaves trying to make a way, you know, or, you know, immigrants who, you know, didn't have pride in their home country. So they went somewhere else, you know, and rather than, you know, this very active breathing, actively being made culture that is always beloved so much so that it is stolen, (laughs) you know, all the time. And so I have so much pride in being part of the diaspora, um, but there is always that like, you know, we we, we exist in this liminal space. Um, In some ways I have more privileges than um, people who are 100% descended from Black American enslaved people, because I, I I have like a very specific link to cultures that I'm descended from. To be honest, most Black American enslaved people did come from West Africa. So whenever they want like African roots, I encourage them to be like, you're probably Yoruba, join our team. <laughs> you know, but um, in in other ways, it's it's just this, you know, I am not nearly Nigerian enough for people in Nigeria. I'm not nearly Black American enough for people here. I've never been white enough for white Americans, obviously. Like, it's just not, you exist in this liminal space. And so I think fantasy means that much more to the diaspora in that we can have a place in which all of the, all of the cultures that intersect 
and make ourselves exist without question, without explanation. It's interesting because so many people market Ray Bear as a West African fantasy book, and it does have lots of like really strong West African elements, but it's a global fantasy in the same way that I feel like a global person. You know, my, my West African heritage is a huge part of who I am, but so is growing up in LA you know, and and all of the American media and all of the British literature that I read for fun and was made to read by a Eurocentric system. And also, you know, the Black American culture that I both descended from and wasn't and, and wasn't able to connect with because of where I lived, which didn't have a lot of Black people. You know, um, all of those things make who I am. And for marketing purposes, it's always easier just to say like, oh, this is a West African fantasy book because African fantasy is hot now. And I'm just like, this is a Jordan fantasy book. <laughs> and there are so many other kids who are that many intersections. I think even black American kids, because they are growing up in an age of globalized media, you know, like I've, I think I heard black people are like the biggest consumers of Japanese anime in the United States like per capita. So even that narrative is informing a lot of their storytelling now, along with all of the traditional black ways of storytelling and all that stuff. And that is authentically them, you know, and fantasy is a place where that kind of intersection can exist. It's not like having to write an alternate history of say, like I'm, I'm I haven't watched Bridgerton, <laughs> but I just, I just from the, the from, you know, descriptions I've seen, it's basically like a fantasy Regency England, you know, and they're ex kind of, you know, they just kind of don't explain why Black people get to be lords <laughs> when they would have been enslaved in Sugarfield and stuff. And while that rubs me the wrong way, I understand the impulse for that, where it's just like, I don't want, I'm so tired of having to make excuses for why I should get to be in this setting. I'm just here and those are the rules of this world and you just need to accept it, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that's what I love about fantasy. That's what I think, I think one of the reasons why diasporic speculative and fantasy fiction is so important is that it's a place we can exist on our own terms, you know? Um, and that's always been really important to me. Excellent, excellent. Woo. You know, you all you all could write a dissertation and or a thesis on what you're doing right here. You know, that's the professor in you. It's just like you know what you could do. Work there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> One last uh, thought question to ask of, of both of you. So when you hear the term, so you know, writing is the the umbrella, and then when you think of the terms resistance, inclusivity, and intersectionality, just without deep thinking. What comes to mind? What what shoot off? What comes to mind for both of you? Oh my goodness! The thing that comes to mind is just why not? <laughs> why not? Uh, just because like it's it's actually not that it's not that difficult when you're you know when you're writing. I, I it's not that difficult to remember to include. Um, and then also with um, you know I did have a team of about uh, twelve people who kept me accountable in the writing of this book who represent the different communities that are in the book. Um, and I did get called out once with regards to um, like, where are all of uh, the disabled people in the book? Like you mentioned them, that they're being oppressed, but then you don't see them. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I and, and being someone who has disabilities myself, I realized that that was my internal thing going on. Like, oh, I, I'm i so ashamed of myself that I didn't include them in, this, in the manuscript. And when I d rewrote it, um, it became stronger, um, making sure that uh, there was um, there was representation there. So it's just it's always why not? I just like why not include people of um, different backgrounds, abilities, everything. Um, it's almost like an honor to me. That's how I put it. Yeah. Um, I one of the many words that left to mind for me was reality. It's like. You know, I'm I'm glad that I'm glad that we've gone beyond the word diversity to try and pivot to inclusion, which is a much better word. But like even at that word, it seems like I could see people seeing it as like, you know, I'm doing a favor. Yes. You know, where it's just like, no, you're just like 
actually writing the world as it is. Like it would be weird if you wrote a, a world in which there were only men, like, you know, that's not realistic, even if it's a fantasy, unless like that's literally the point of the fantasy <laughs> is that it's this weird dystopia where, you know, but like all of these people exist and always have and have been a big part of the narrative, even in places you wouldn't think they exist. Even if you're like, no, this is a fantasy based in the British Isles. I'm just like, I'm sorry, black people were there too, man. <laughs> like we were everywhere. The, the idea of historical Europe that you think existed is informed by like a fantasy Europe that you saw through like movies and TV series where like any historian will tell you, it's just like, there have always been black and brown people you know, like, do you know how close like Rome is to Africa and how they kind of colonized the whole continent? Like we've, we've, we've had ways to get there and we have been there hundreds of thousands of years and thousands of years. So it's, yeah, it's, it's more like, it's interesting because I have found, I have gotten through to some of the most just like, you know, they're already geared up to be like, oh, you know, I'm not one of those like feminist, social justice warrior snowflakes, you know, like, and it's interesting because even though I kind of avoid talking to those people, period, <laughs> when I do intersect with them, I have found I've gotten through to them by being like, oh, well, I just thought you'd want to be realistic. Like, you know, didn't I, I, I just thought you were the kind of person who historical realism would be important to you. But if you want this fantasy world in which they all look the same, then I guess you can write that. And that's where you get the stuttering, like, oh, well, you know, it's not, it's just, I didn't, you know, think it. I'm just like, they, they were there. I mean, look it up. Like, I just, hey, <laughs> you know, because I think a lot of, a lot of people want to put themselves in the seat of the realist and you in the fantasy of like the desperate, you know, identity politics person who just wants everything to be about you and it's just like and to turn that mirror back on them and be like actually you're the one who's not being realistic because we've always been here <laughs> you know is a very simple and effective you know response <laughs> so um yeah i would just say reality um it's okay to not write realistic things but you have to have a reason why you can't just you know, or it, it, it's going to stick out to people who know that they were there and they existed and you should want to write, you know, things that reflect the truth if you possibly can. Absolutely, great answers. Awesome, excellent. <laughs> yes, whoo. Once again, you all have made my day. And thank <laughs> you. Um, this, is, this is great, this is awesome. Um, I want to make sure that re future readers, because I'm going to claim it for you all that, you know, uh, folks that come to the panel and that have come to the panel are going to buy the book, read the book and share it with others. So where can readers follow you all on, on the internet? Where can they reach out to give you that review that, that is so, so needed to make sure that others can, can pick up and see what, what, you know, what they might be missing. So please share with us um, where we can find you on, uh, on the internet. You wanna go ahead, Jordan? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I am now pretty much exclusively on Instagram at Jordan E. Fueco. Um, I do have a Twitter account, but I have kind of like an unhealthy co-obsessive Kathy Heathcliff relationship with Twitter. So it is locked down right now. And I am telling people to follow me on Instagram instead. Ray Bear is available anywhere books are sold. There is both a American and a British edition, depending on where you are. It's probably Virginia, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I do hope you support your indie bookstores. Please, please, please. One really lovely one is Once Upon a Time Books, um, which is here in Southern California and they ship everywhere and have deals and I go and sign books for them all the time if you want to sign a copy. Um, and yeah, the audiobooks are really cool too. So maybe, you know, get those from Libro FM. Amazing. I love the I love the cup. Um, I'm going to do the Vanna White thing. So this is the <laughs> Canadian version. Um, and this is the American version. Um, and the UK version is coming up in April. Um, but uh, yeah, the books uh, can be sold wherever that they're sorry, they can be bought wherever books are sold. Although please do buy local. 
Um, one book that I, a bookstore that I really love is Another Story Bookshop here in Toronto. They send out um, internationally. Um, and my audio book, which was top 10 book in Audible, was, um, which is read, and it's read by me, and it was read in this closet. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was yeah so uh, that one's it's a it's available on audible and there you go yeah awesome awesome excellent yes well thank you both again for uh taking your time to talk with us about what's happening and you know and what's going on in your literary mind and in your books and like i said please please make sure uh that you all go and get the book and so since we're going to wrap this thing up here, um, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you to everyone who is watching. Like I said, please consider buying or, or just go ahead and buy. I'm not going to say consider. Let's go ahead and buy um, these featured books from your local independent bookseller or using um, the link that is provided on vabook.org. And you can also check out some of the other events of our all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. Once again, thank you uh, both and, you know, happy reading to everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs>